I'm a professor at uh, Technion Computer Science. Um, I'm also one of the seven uh, founding scientists of uh, Zcash. And uh, I'm going to tell you mostly about joint work with Ido Bentov, Yenon Horish, and Michael Ryabtsev. And it will have three parts. The first part is going to be a little bit more um, theoretical. The second part is going to be very practical. And then the third part is going to be, again, more theoretical. OK, so those, and I'll tell you when we're moving between the parts. And you can stop me and ask questions. OK, so um, I want to tell you, first of all, about the sort of the theoretical models in which we like to play these games and, and build these proof systems. And then I want to talk to you about the way we realize them and some numbers of benchmarks. And then again, go back to some theory that applies to both Starks and to Snarks. OK, so uh, I'm going to tell you about something called an interactive oracle proof. It's a kind of a game that mathematicians uh, like to study. It's very clean mathematically, and you can make a lot of progress studying this game. But it's unrealistic if you want to use it in practice. Um, then I'm going to tell you about a special kind of, of, of IOPs, interactive oracle proofs, that are really, really efficient, almost optimally so. And uh, they're going to be really great. And again, we can prove a lot of things about them, even without any cryptographic assumptions. But again, they are unrealistic. And then if you go and realize them, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and you realize such a stick, then you get something that is practical. And you do need cryptographic assumptions, but very lean ones, ones that are post-quantum secure. They don't have any number theory involved in them. They don't require a trusted setup, and that sort of stuff. So, um, that's how you get a Stark in the end. Good, so let's start. Um, we play these games about computational integrity statements. So Bob makes a claim that he wishes to convince the world. And he says, I know some private witness, W, such if you take, if I would take that witness and run a specific computation, C, on this thing that only I know, and also some public input that everyone knows, then I'll reach an output of Y within T steps. This is a very general statement, but examples are the Zcash joint split. That's a special case of such a computation. Or if you want a proof of solvency, um, or that you own enough coins, and you could have applications in smart contracts, and so on and so forth. So we like to study these very abstract settings. OK. So what is this game called an interactive oracle proof? It's a game of many rounds between a prover, that's Bob, and a verifier that could be anyone. And the game, the best way to think about it is that the prover sends a USB stick that the verifier keeps. And then the verifier tosses some random coins, public or private, and sends a message back to the prover. And the prover sends another USB stick that depends also on the randomness that he was asked. OK, and, and this goes on for a while. And then at the end, so the verifier, in this case Alice, has collected a bunch of USB sticks. And now she tosses some more coins. And based on those coins, she goes and queries a few random locations of the data written on these various USB sticks. And she plugs it into some computation. And based on that computation, she decides whether to accept or reject the statement. OK, so it's a very simple game, one in which you, you get a USB stick, you send some randomness, and so on and so forth. OK. And uh, we would say that this game is good for the purpose we made it up if it has completeness, which means that a true statement, if Bob really knows this private W, then he can indeed convince through this game with USB sticks. Um, he can convince uh, the verifier that it's true. And soundness is, is the more tricky and important part, that if uh, uh, the statement is indeed false, or Bob doesn't know this W, then it's going to be very unlikely for him to uh, convince the verifier that the statement is true. So it's an unrealistic model, um, but it's mathematically clean. And why do I say it's mathematically clean? Because with this um, um, model, within this model, we could say if you would, were willing to play this game, um, you could take any kind of computation, even if the prover has to run exponentially longer than what the verifier will do. Um, this is a class of problems called NEXP. Then any one of these problems that includes the joint split circuit and various smart contracts and a lot more, uh, you can have this sort of uh, IOP that's also really, really great. First of all, it has zero knowledge, but it has a bunch of colored terms here that I'm now going to explain. So it's fully scalable, it's transparent, it's an IOP of knowledge, and it has perfect zero knowledge. 
Okay, and this is joint work also with uh, Alessandro Chiesa, Ariel Gabizon, sitting here, Madar Zvirza, all of us are with uh, Zcash, and um, then there's follow-up work also with uh, Mike Forbes, um, Michael Ryabtsev, and Nick Spooner. So let me explain now those colored terms. So fully scalable or doubly scalable means scalable proving time and scalable verifying time. Prover time scales almost linearly in the time it would have taken just to run the computation. So instead of taking t steps, it takes t times log t to some small exponent. Hopefully the exponent is small. Sometimes it's called quasi-linear time. And it's not hard to show that prover cannot run less than t steps. So up to this polylog factor, it's optimal on the prover side. And at the same time, it's also optimal on the verifier side. The verifier needs at least to specify the statement, and, and, and log t is, 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 an, is a theoretical lower bound for this, for this thing. And you can still get the verifier to run only in log t, which is the bare minimum needed to some power. Transparency means there is no trusted setup. There, is no, um, there are no secrets. All the randomness the verifier needs is just uh, public random coins. So in particular, if you could think of a setup where you have a blockchain with blocks coming along once in a while and containing some, some randomness in them, you could say, we don't need the verifier. If, everyone, if everyone's watching the blockchain, we could extract the randomness from there and have that play the side of the verifier. And you would get public verifiability in a very transparent way that everyone can sort of believe in. Okay, an IOP of knowledge, I don't want to go into the definition, but um, it actually means that if Alice takes the USB sticks and opens everything up in them, then she can find this witness, which seems to be contradicting perfect zero knowledge, which says that it's the strongest form of zero knowledge in, in a mathematical defined way. Um, now, the last two bullets seem to contradict each other because if Alice gets the USB sticks and reads everything in them, she can recover W. So, but the last bullet says that looking at the interaction, Alice learns nothing. And this is part of why we say that the model is unrealistic. Because, first of all, sending USB sticks is kind of inconvenient, but worse, if Alice has these sticks and she is malicious, she can compromise zero knowledge. So for these two reasons, we need something else to, 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 to implement this, this model. And this goes back 30 years or more to uh, basic works of, of uh, Killian and Mikali on how to take uh, protocols like these, uh, things called PCPs, uh, of which IOPs are a generalization, and how you can convert them into practical things. So you can do it in two ways. Basically, and, and the solution should seem reasonable to anyone uh, working with blockchains, instead of sending this whole big message, this USB stick, what, what the prover does is uh, compute a Merkle root of the information, a hash, and that's a commitment to everything he wants to send, and he sends that. So it's a very short message. And then he gets randomness. And then he sends another hash, a Merkle root hash for the second USB stick. And then at the end, um, Alice or the verifier will ask him some questions. And whenever he opens those questions, he will uh, append to them um, an authentication path proving that it was the uh, second USB, okay, as claimed. And these are standard things that are done with Merkle trees. Good. And you could do it in two interactively. Yeah, you could do this uh, interactively, which means, let's say, you could rely on a blockchain and wait a block each time to get new randomness, or you could have someone send the randomness, or you could do it also non-interactively, in which basically you take uh, um, the hash of the latest message and you think of it as the randomness that the verifier sends. And both of these now, both of these realizations now require um, some cryptographic assumptions. Uh, so we're moving away by doing this from the clean theoretical abstract game, uh, and we rely either on collision-resistant hash functions in the interactive case, in an I Stark, or you take, uh, you do a non-interactive one, you get an N Stark, and um, then uh, we need something called the random oracle assumption, which is commonly used, but uh, mathematically not as clean as the games we started playing. Good. 
So a good research question, I mean, st snarks and starks have similar sound and it's on purpose, but a research question that I actually do not know to answer formally, there are definitions for these two things, uh, are all n starks non-interactive? St so interactive starks are clearly not snarks because the n in snark is non-interactive. So you can't have an interactive, non-interactive thing. But you could ask whether an n stark is actually always necessarily a snark. It's a question that I think is interesting and answerable, but I haven't looked at it. Okay, um, but they definitely serve the same purpose, which is uh, proving in zero knowledge very, very efficiently uh, general statements about computation. Good. So we talked a little bit about theory and what we've been doing. Uh, um, it took actually quite a long time, but we now have some implementations of, of Starks that have um, either without zero knowledge or with zero knowledge. So the first uh, Stark without zero knowledge was presented about a year and a half ago at Eurocrypt. It's, it's a whole bunch of authors. Ariel is one of them, as is uh, among the Zcash founders. It also includes uh, Alessandro Chiesa, Eran Tomer, and Madar Zvirza. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone here. And uh, a whole bunch of uh, students of mine at Technion. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to waste all the time on, on this. So, um, and now we're, we, we, we have the first ZK Stark. It's based on a theoretical um, zero knowledge, succinct, trans trans sorry, scalable, transparent IOP of knowledge, which is, again, one of those theoretical constructions. And that's, again, joint work with Ariel, um, Madels, and Alessandro. And we have already the proof of concept code. I'll show you some, some, some benchmarks. Um, the paper takes always much longer um, if you think that to debug code takes long, then debugging papers is, I guess, similar, if not worse. So, uh, or just writing them. And one component already appears online. It's a very clean and separated thing that uh, those of you who like algebra, I urge you to download it and, and read it. And you can actually implement it both over prime fields and over um, binary fields. Uh, I think it's very digestible for those who, who, know, who know algebra or took, uh, okay. So some part of, of, of the new Stark is already out there, and the rest I hope so. Okay, we're done with the first part, which is sort of abstract. Now I want to show you what happens like in terms of running time when we use this realization, this, this Stark, this zero-knowledge Stark. Good. So those of you sort of spaced out because it was very abstract, now I'm just going to show you some running times and measurements. So the benchmark I'm going to talk about is this uh, setting where the FBI um, has, let's say, a DNA profile database, um, and it is willing to publish daily a, a Merkle, ha sorry, a hash of the state of this database. And in it are basically the DNA profiles taken from all crime scenes. And each DNA profile is then compressed, you know, analyzed and compressed, and it turns out to be uh, 40 integers. Okay, that's sort of each one of us, if, if our sa DNA sample is taken, it is reduced to a set of, a set of 40 integers. And the yeah, publishes this daily, and now um, someday along, let's say, um, a new head of the, um, you know, head of the FBI uh, solicited, and What should I do? Like this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try like this. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, microphones are really uh, spooky things. What? Oh, okay. Do not touch this thing. Okay, I will do like this. Okay, so um, um, the FBI's database is posted, and now there's supposed to be a new head of the FBI, and the public is worried whether he's uh, sort of shady. And uh, you know the FBI wants to convince the public that this uh, is not the case, and that they can run uh, a profile match search of the incoming head of police or whatever against this um, forensic DNA profile database and report the match. Okay, so that's the program that we actually implemented, and the program is written down there. It's sort of um, the public input X that everyone sees is a hash commitment to the database and a hash commitment to the uh, incoming uh, chief of police. And um, the witness that only the FBI should hold are the pre-images of the database, uh, a pretty large you know, string or uh, set of uh, 
profiles and also the pre-image of, of this uh, incoming chief of police's uh, DNA. Good. And they run this computation where they both compute the hash and compare it to the publicly known hashes. And they also check uh, some profile match, which is uh, it's not just a string equality. There are some little logical complications there, but nothing too deep. Good. So we ran this thing, actually, on a, on a kind of a large machine that has um, like 16 cores. I mean, 32 AMD cores, which are, I just learned recently, it's like 16 cores with hyper-threading. Uh, never mind. And half a terabyte of RAM. And so we managed to run it all the way up to a million profiles, which is a um, 40 megabyte size file. And is there any way to maybe decrease the light for a minute because probably only the first row can see anything. Is there a way? What? Can you guys in the back see anything? I mean, there you'll see some graphs here. Okay, on the top, there are various measures for the prover side, for the side generating the proofs. This would be the FBI. And on the bottom, there are measures for the folks, you know, the public, us, trying to um, verify it. And for instance, what we see here is the ratio of uh, proving running time to naive running time. So when the pro when the when the database size is kind of small, so it's only 50,000 times more time, it takes 50,000, x 50,000 more time to generate a proof than it is to just naively run the computation. And then it jumps up to like 250,000, and right about this is where we sort of max the RAM out and we need to start doing either swapping or redoing the proof. So presumably if we get more RAM, then we would be able to do it only at 50,000 times more or slower than just doing the um, generate, just running the computation without any proofs. Um, this is the overall proving time, so it takes much less than one second if you just have a very small database, and it takes about a day to generate the proof for um, you know the whole million size database. By the way, I think the USA's uh, forensic DNA profile is around 20 million or so, sort of located at different places. So we're not that far away even today uh, from being able to prove something on that large database. And here we have the proof size. This is like an internal measure, um, a theoretical measure of the amount of space that the prover needs, not the amount that he's sending. Over here we have the verifier side. And um, what we can see is the communication complexity. It's the amount of information being sent. Now the prover we can run even, sorry, the verifier we can measure even on, on, on data for which we cannot generate proofs. Because the verifier can, it, it just makes some queries and then checks if everything, if, if everything is fine. So we might as well generate, see what the verifier looks like, even for inputs that we cannot yet generate proofs for. That's what we did here. So we ran all the way up to uh, two to the 36 um, entries, which is pretty big. It's like two to the six times gigabytes, right? Giga many entries, so billions of entries, much more than there are people um, you know, living on the face of the earth today. And even there at the end, you get something like around a 1.2 megabyte long uh, argument if you do it non-interactively, again, for something that would be many, many gigabytes of information. So we actually get compression in space. And um, I mean, by the way, so, so we said there's a, a clean mathematical model, and that costs very little of the communication complexity, and most of it is about the authentication paths uh, from these Merkles. Um, another interesting thing that we'll talk about later in a minute, um, yeah, and the overall running time starts at 20 milliseconds, and even for two to the 36, it would have taken less than 80 milliseconds to verify, so which would be, have been much faster than doing it um, naively. Now, because of this, um, because the verification time is exponentially faster than naive computation time, right? It, is, it behaves like log of t as opposed to t, where t is the running time. We can talk about compression functions. So the time compression function is the time it takes to verify a statement divided by the time it takes to run the statement. And if this value is above one, it means your verification takes longer than just running the computation. But once it goes below one, you're actually saving on verification time. And you could do the same thing with space. 
Supposing that the witness is this non-deterministic um, you know, proof that the um, computation is good, you could compare the size of that proof with the argument that comes from, from using a proof system. And again, you could divide the communication complexity of the proof system by the size of the database. And one, this, once this ratio goes below one, you're actually compressing. And uh, this is something we're very proud of. We actually manage in practice for the first time to overcome, to overcome both the time compression and the space compression functions, which means that we actually generated proofs and verified them in time that is about, I think, four times faster and compresses by a factor of uh, 50. So, but as you can see from the plots, because of this exponential speed up, the larger the data sets in general and the larger the scope of the computation, the more impressive that your um, compression in space and in time must be. So we're very optimistic that in the future we'll see even more compressions. And you know, there's a big discussion about scalability of blockchains in general, right? How do we process millions of or thousands of transactions? So I think that one very viable long-term solution is to use things like this because they can really offload the whole task of proving the integrity of a very big system in a way that's mathematically very clean, post-quantum secure, you don't need any trusted setups, and it's also very efficient on the prover and verifier side. So there's a bunch of other um, um, really cool approaches, scientific approaches to addressing this question of, of, uh, of proving statements with zero knowledge. And I'm just listing a few of the theoretical things that have been implemented in practice and comparing them asymptotically along these uh, desirable properties. So you would like something that has a scalable prover, a scalable verifier, you would want the proofs to be transparent and you would want them to be post-quantum secure. So the very first approach, it's based on homomorphic public key cryptography, there is a whole uh, line of works here, but this includes the SNARKs and quadratic arithmetic programs of Gennaro et al. Um, so you can see it has a scalable prover. The, the verifier is scalable only after the pre-processing phase. So for a, a computation that goes time and time again, that's not an issue, something like the join split circuit of Zcash. But if you want you know, modify circuits and generate new ones um, or tweak with them a little bit, then you're gonna have to have this pre-processing phase that makes the verifier non-scalable for a single computation. Um, they're not transparent and not post-quantum secure. There's a nice approach based on the discrete log problem by Goth that takes away, it makes the system transparent, but it's not post-quantum secure and the verifier isn't scalable. There's one, again, that even is post-quantum secure based on running an MPC protocol in the head, and you can also apply incrementally verifiable computation on top of any system, and this is something we implemented. It's not transparent and post-quantum secure, but it is scalable, theoretically. And as you can see, Stark um, is green the whole line through which is why I think, you know, in the long run, this is the way to go. And in terms of running time, so I took these theoretical approaches and we actually take, took the same computation and saw how different systems measure up on the same machine, you know, trying to compare apples to apples as best we could. So lower is better. And what you can see here is that the prover generation time is almost best for Stark. I mean, the MPC in the head is slightly better. Um, but the verifier running time here is pretty large, 32 seconds versus 40 milliseconds. Now, with SNARKs, which are the yellow thing, so if you take into account the um, time needed to generate parameters, then you get really long pr uh, verifier time because the verifier is the one generating the parameters. That's 28 seconds. But of course, assuming that you've done that, and also there's a very large communication complexity for sending this key. But once you did that and you assume everyone has it, then verification time of SNARKs is of course fastest, nine milliseconds versus 40 milliseconds, and the proofs are extremely short. Uh, 0.23 kilobyte versus, in our case, uh, 452. And um, this is, I forgot, oh, this is the discrete log based, um, eight kilobytes, and this is 6.5 megabytes. Okay, and uh, as time will go on, we'll see more and more implementations, and even along these lines, we'll see them all going down, which is, of course, great. Good. So, I talked a little bit about the numbers we're getting right now in our proof of concept code, and now, the very last part, I wanna go back again to theory 
And I'm I want to tell you a little bit about arithmetization. And arithmetization is this um, nice thing that is also part of the theory that is behind both SNARKs and STARKs, and also all those other systems that I showed you. So all the implemented systems, in the end, there's a very strong component of arithmetization. So that's going to be the last thing I want to tell you about. So everything I say now is relevant both to SNARKs and to STARKs and to things based on discrete log and to running an MPC in the head and a bunch of other approaches. It's a very powerful and beautiful technique, and I want to explain it to you just a little bit. Good. So arithmetization is like, it goes back to even to Gödel's proof of the incompleteness theorem. Uh, for those of you who learned about it, it's a fundamental theorem in logic and philosophy. Um, then it was used in the 80s by Razborov, uh, a famous theoretical computer science to prove uh, theoretical results that I won't go into. And then it was modified and brought into the world of these proof systems by Fortnow and Babai. And since then, it's been used uh, to great extent. So, okay, now we're starting, again, a little bit of math. So those who haven't seen these things and don't know what a polynomial is, I, I apologize. It's going to be a little bit fast. But those of you who have seen, I hope it's, uh, you know, you, you, you'll enjoy this. Okay, so a polynomial is this formal sum. It's really a computer program of, of a very special kind that allows you only to do multiplication and, and addition, okay? And the degree is the maximal term, the maximal degree. So uh, x to the 5 is a degree 5 polynomial, and lines are degree 1 polynomials, and these parabolas we study in uh, high school are degree 2 polynomials, so on and so forth. Good. Now, we'll say that a function that is evaluated on a set of points is called, is said to be a, a, of degree d, if the polynomial that describes that function is a degree d polynomial. So these are two slightly different objects, right? If I see a line on the plane, okay, and I take the sequence of, of points that, that, this, that comprise this, this line, that is a function. For every x value, I get a y value. But we will say that it's a degree one function. And the same thing with a parabola, right? So I'll say it's a, it's a quadratic function, degree two function. Okay, so these are some basic definitions. And the fact that we're gonna use is that two distinct polynomials of degree d can intersect at at most d points. For instance, two lines, if they're not the same line, they can intersect only at a single point. Two degree two, two parabolas, if they're not the same parabola, they intersect only at two points, and so on and so forth. Okay, good. And this is a very important property. So this is how we're gonna use it. If you have two distinct functions that have degree d, but you ask for their evaluation on 100 times d points, then they will disagree if they're not the same function. They either agree completely on all of these 100 times d evaluation points, or they disagree on at least 99%. So if you sample a random point and they're not the same function, with 99% probability, you'll see that they're not the same function. And we'll use this to um, find uh, you know, falsities or see if we're being cheated. And formally, you could say that the space of uh, low degree functions form um, an error correcting code. And it has a name. The Reed Solomon code was discovered. This use of it was discovered and studied in the early 60s. Interesting fact is that it was studied in the early 60s and started getting implemented in CDs and DVDs in the mid 90s, so 35 years. And things like zero knowledge proofs started you know, were discovered and invented in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and now we're in 2017, so that's roughly 35, 37 years till they start getting implemented in things like Zcash. You know, people actually use them as opposed to just study them. Okay, so there's this three and a half decades of separation between science and realization. Good. So here's, here's, here's our goal now, right? We're talking about, I want to try and convince you that it is possible. I want to show you some of the magic that goes into Bob being able to prove to Alice a statement that Alice doesn't have even the time to run and, and verify. So here's a very simple example. As part of this complicated computation, Bob is claiming to Alice, you know, there's this, uh, there's this register, and its type, or its range, 
it always has the value values between one and ten, and it's really important to the you know the, the bigger argument. Maybe this is the program counter, and you know it's a ten-line program, so it never goes be over below one and above ten. But the thing is that Bob is making this claim about a really large number of points. He's saying there are a million points or a million values in this array that all of them are between the range of one and ten. So the goals we would like are we would like to find a way to trust Bob's claim. Can he prove that he's correct? And we would like later on to talk about privacy. Can, will this proof leak information about, about these million, about some of these million points? We would like it not to because it's part of what zero knowledge is supposed to do. And the last thing is can we do it succinctly? Can we make sure that Alice doesn't have to work very hard and, and you know, query all of these million points. So, this is the first claim. Bob claims, I have a list of 10 to the 6 integers. They're all in the range 1 to the 10. And the question to you is, can you see a way for Alice to check this statement with just two queries and still have 99% probability of of finding if, if Bob is cheating. Any ideas? Is it possible? No, it's not possible, right? Because, uh, you know, Alice has to check all of them. There's a million of them, and if she doesn't check one, she might be wrong with, uh, okay. So, so Bob really wants to convince Alice that this is the case. So he says, you know what? I've added redundancy and more information to sort of convince you, and I took and encoded this list Using So what I did is I interpolated. I found what is the degree 1 million polynomial that goes through these points. And then I evaluated that polynomial on many, many more points, on a billion points, 10 to the 9. Will you now you know, trust me with this claim? So the question goes again. Can Alice now make two queries and, and find if this is the case? What do you think? What? Who thinks this can be done? Raise your hand with just this information? Who thinks it cannot be done with just this information? No other information. Okay, so the, the second, the, those in this, it cannot be done with just this information. It's not enough information, okay? Because actually, um, you still need to read basically a million points in order to find out this thing. Okay, so Bob is really frustrated. He says, Alice, what more, what more do you want me to, you know, what more do you need in order to be convinced? So Alice will say, um, you know what? I'm gonna ask you for a favor, Bob. Please evaluate one more polynomial. And, you know, give me any polynomial of degree 10 to the seven minus 10 to the six. So it's like nine million. That is, that is the degree of the polynomial I seek. You can give anyone you want. But if you do it well, and your claim is true, then I will know with 99% certainty if that's the case, okay? And this already works now. So it seems it's almost like the second claim, right? It's still the same claim, but there's just a little bit more information, right? Bob is giving two evaluations of polynomials of weird degrees, one of degree a million and the other one of degree nine million. And Alice says, you know, that's enough for me to know if you're saying the truth or not. So here's how this magic can happen. And she's just gonna read two points and still be convinced that this is true. So let's define this weird polynomial C of X. It's not so weird, it's a polynomial that has exactly 10 roots there are 10 values that make it vanish or make it become zero. And these 10 values are exactly the numbers one to 10, right? If you take, if x is two, then this term becomes zero and zero times everything else is zero. Same thing with one up to 10. So this is a polynomial of degree 10. It's a polynomial of degree 10 and if you open it up, you'll get uh, 10 terms. Um, okay, good. And again, this is a very important polynomial to our problem because it captures the range or the type thing that we want to check, right? We want to check that something is in the range 1 to 10. It's really that what we want to do is check that this polynomial vanishes if you plug into it those points. Now, similarly, this, this will be sort of a, 
an, sort of an added construction, but it's of the same flavor. So there's this polynomial d of x that you construct it in the same way, but it vanishes on the points one up to a million instead of one up to 10. So basically, this is the polynomial that captures what are the points on which Bob is making his claim, right? Because Bob says for the first million entries of the array, for the points one up to a million, the, uh, the value of the function is between one and 10. So we're sort of algebraically defining what is the space that we care about. Good, so we have these two polynomials. And now this is the actual test that Alice is going to use, okay? And first I'll convince you that it makes two queries, and then we're gonna discuss why it actually accepts with probability one true claims, whereas it rejects with 99% probability any falsity that Bob's makes, which is really gonna be magical. So what is the test? The test is rather simple. Alice tosses a coin. So remember, what Bob did is he wrote down these two polynomials. Um, one, and both of them are evaluated on the numbers one up to a billion, okay? So you have like two tables, two arrays, or two USB sticks, if you think of them. And this is Alice's test. She picks a random, you know, she tosses coins, she picks a random number between one and a billion, and then she, let's call it x naught, and then she queries the first function and the second function at the same point. And let's suppose that the answers are alpha and beta. We'll, we'll, that's how we'll denote them. And then all Alice does is she says, I will accept Bob's claim that all the numbers between one and a million are in the range one to 10, if and only if C of alpha, so she plugs alpha into this polynomial of degree 10, and she says, I will accept if and only C of alpha equals B times D, this weird polynomial, when I plug alpha into it, sorry, X zero into it, okay? So let's see what we understand now. This is a test that makes only two queries, one to F and one to G. That's all we know. Now, does it work? So in proof systems, there are two parts. There's completeness, proving that correct statements can be proved with high probability. And the hardest part is soundness, which is proving that a falsity is rejected with high probability. Let's start with a simpler statement where Bob is honest. So really, the first million values have been between one to 10, and then he took a low degree extension, so he sort of interpolated and then evaluated on a billion points, and that's his F. What? We'll see in a minute what G should be. Right now, all Alice said to Bob is, you can give me any polynomial you want, any evaluation, any function of degree uh, nine million, but now we'll see what, it, what an honest Bob would use. There's just one he can use, so that's what we'll see now. So let's see, and, and we're heading towards constructing this G. Okay, so we said that F is, uh, you know, is, is this good function, and it, it is of degree a million, and P of X is the interpolant, is the polynomial that describes it. Now, if we plug P of X into the polynomial C, we get a new polynomial, but this polynomial will vanish on all points between one and a million. Why? P, we, we assume that P of X on all points between one and a million gives you a value between one and 10, and if you plug a number between one and 10 into C, you get zero. That's exactly what C does. So assuming that P of X uh, has the range between one and 10 on the first million entries, then C of P of X will vanish on the first million entries. Okay, we just restated. But here's a nice fact. So a polynomial vanishes at a point x naught if and only if you can divide it by x minus x naught, which means if and only if there exists a q prime, q prime is not the derivative, um, some other polynomial of degree exactly one less such that q of x equals x minus x naught times q prime of x. And if a polynomial vanishes on a million points, so there are many x naughts that you can divide, you can repeat dividing qx by x minus x naught. And here's the corollary. So if you look at c of p of x and call it q of x, 
it vanishes on the domain one to a million only if there exists some Q prime that is of degree a million less than the degree of Q, and that's exactly nine million, such that Q prime of x times D of x, this uh, pre-specified polynomial, equals Q of x. So now let me return the question to you. What is G of x going to be? What G of x, what function will you evaluate so that this equality always holds? Exactly, Q prime. So what Bob does is he sets G to be, the, to be the evaluation of G prime. And because this equality holds, sorry, because, Q, because C of P of X equals D times Q prime of X, if you P of X, if you evaluate it, you get F. Q prime, if you evaluate it, you get G. So you get that this equals this always, and in particular, this equals this always. So the test passes with probability one. Now the harder part, I said, is soundness. So what, what, what we've seen is that an honest Bob can convince Alice with probability one in a test that she makes only two queries about. So let's look at the other case. Now suppose Bob is cheating, and for simplicity, every element in this array is between one and 10, but for the very first one, which has the value 11. So if Alice is just gonna check some random things, she won't notice this. She has probability of one in a million of picking the first entry. Now, again, we do the same process. We let P of X be the interpolant of F. And the point is that C, when you plug P of X into it, it does not vanish on all points between one and a million. There's one point on which it does not vanish. On one, on the point one, if X, if X zero equals one, then C of P of X does not equal zero. It equals something else. Okay, it seems like we're in the same case as before. There's just one entry out of a million on which the value of this function is, is, one, is not zero. It doesn't seem Alice has a chance. But, you see, for any other low degree polynomial Q prime that Bob would take and evaluate as his G, we know that the product Q prime times D does vanish on all first million points, right? Because why does, this, why does Q prime of X times D of X vanish on the first million points for any choice of Q prime X? Why does the product vanish on the first million points? It's a product of two, of two polynomials, and if one of them is zero, it will, that polynomial will annihilate and make the other one be zero or not matter. And D of X was defined to be a polynomial that vanishes on the first million points. So this product, whatever Bob picks for Q prime and evaluates as G, this product does vanish on the first million points. So C of P of X does not, value, does not vanish on the first million, on all of the first million points, whereas D of X, sorry, whereas, um, this product does vanish on all. So the two polynomials are not the same. You would think that they only differ on one point in the first million entries, and that may be the case, but recall that we said that degree D polynomials, if they don't agree completely, they can agree on at most D points. Now, we took two polynomials of degree nine million, but they're not the same. So they can agree only on nine million points, whereas we have, um, sorry, it's actually 10 million. I mean, this is a polynomial of 10 million, this is a polynomial of 10 million, and we actually have evaluations on a billion points. So they could agree, the two sides of the equation could agree on 10 million points out of a billion. That's one in a 100 chance. They disagree on 99% of the domain which means that for random x naught, the probability of failure is 99% in this case. So I just wanna summarize because my, my time is up. What have we seen? We've seen that you can take a, a statement that discusses a very huge array, a type checking statement, which is a basic thing that is part of checking correctness of a computation. And even though the statement refers to a million points, 
you can ask the prover, the ma person making the statement, to use polynomials, two polynomials in this case, so that you can easily distinguish between truisms and falsities with only two queries. That's what we achieved. And this is, this is what arithmetization does. Now, the only remaining problem that we have, and this is where snarks and starks differ, is how do you ensure that Bob gives you evaluations of low-degree polynomials in the first place? And I have two, one, my time is up, but you know, there's some more papers that need to be read in order to find this, but you could do it the snark way or the stark way, and with this I'll end. Thank you.